Hey guys, it's Goosebumps Completionist, and welcome to a little collab video surprise I have for you. We're going to be talking about Goosebumps, the movie from 2015, and Goosebumps 2, also known as Goosebumps 2 Haunted Halloween. I'm joined today with the Horror Tavern and Goosebumps Enthusiast. Uh, Horror Tavern, how are you doing tonight? Yo, 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 people of the night, it's your boy, the Horror Tavern, a.k.a. Money Mike, a.k.a. the Yin to Ezekiel's Yang, a.k.a. about to go hit up Mrs. Caldwell from the old show, a.k.a. we ready to go and talk about Goosebumps 2015 and Haunted Halloween. Uh, this is one I'm excited to do because all of us have a little bit slightly different takes. Uh, we got the people's hero in the corner of this episode, Bruce. He's about to mediate this conversation um, because we're about to go into some Potentially hot takes, some potentially good takes for y'all. I mean, we think it's going to be a fun collab. So hope y'all are excited. Yeah, I hope you're all excited too. Um, how are you doing tonight, Bruce? It's good to see you. I'm doing great. And just like BD said, I'm also excited because, well, folks, spoiler alert, this was the movie that got me not only into goosebumps, but also into horror in general. This movie means a lot to me and a lot to my heart. And it's Super nice to discuss it, especially with these two fellows. Check them out. They're awesome. Nice. Um, so <clears throat> we got two movies to discuss. And I don't know who wants to take the floor first. I'll pass it over to y'all if y'all want to talk about 2015. Tell us what the story's about. Give us a basic rundown of the plot. And then we can start passing around our reviews or thoughts on the movie. So who wants to take it over? Go ahead, Bruce. This is your debut. This is your All right, movie. Bruce. All right, this is for you. All right. Uh, tell us about Goosebumps 2015. So, Goosebumps 2015 is about a boy named, I think it's Zach, who is moving into a new neighborhood with his single mother. And, well, his next-door neighbor, uh, R.L. Stein, little do we know, has some very interesting stuff going around his house. And he starts to get curious as to what exactly is happening. He hears screaming, he hears a lot of weird stuff, and he calls police on, uh, well, Arl Stein, because he's worried for Megan. Now, what happens is, it turns out not to be uh, actual, like, child abuse or anything of that nature, but it's actually, like, a horror movie or something. And what eventually happens is uh, they get more curious, and him and his friend Champ go back to the house, break in, and accidentally unlock a Goosebumps book. Now, the Goosebumps book comes to life, and basically a pandemonium happens where, you know, domino after domino, Goosebumps books are getting released until Slappy uh, comes to life, and all hell breaks loose. The city goes wild, and it's kind of like a monster apocalypse with just tons and tons of Goosebumps monsters roaming the city. People are dying, people are getting hurt, and they need to save the world. Um if anyone wants to take this, you can go ahead. Okay, so I guess I can go a little bit in detail. So, essentially, you got basically layers to the story where before the actual um, chaos takes place, um, you do get a little bit of a relationship set up, potentially between Hannah and Zach. You know, Zach has been very lonely his entire life. He doesn't have a father figure with him. I believe his father passed away, but I may be wrong. Um, I think he might have been on the police force. And essentially, with his single mother being a part of the school. She's a part of the faculty there. Um, he feels very nervous because he's a little bit embarrassed about his situation. He's kind of like a fish out of water, and he wants to find people to get along with. Um, that's how you get introduced to Champ. Champ is the people's hero. This is the people's hero, man. He is the dude. He's cringy. He's corny, but at the same time, you love him. He's a lovable guy. He seems really genuine, and he basically starts becoming uh, friends with Zach, and then you get introduced to Hannah, um, his next door neighbor, and he starts getting a little bit of a love connection. You start building this sort of, I guess, not coming of age, but the setup to like a coming of age story where these kids are really trying to, you know, set up kind of like new lives for themselves, new personas, because all three of them kind of have identity crises and all three of them, you know, are looking for that new opportunity in their lives. However, as Bruce brought up, R.L. Stein is the neighbor and Zach ends up having weird encounters where he thinks that potentially Hannah may be getting abused by R.L. Stein. He doesn't know what's happening. He thinks something may be going on. Maybe she's a prisoner there. And that's how this whole dilemma happens. Um, and then you get into the first book, The Abominable Snowman of Pasadena. And from then on forward, let's just say a little wooden dummy 
decides, you know what, it's my time to shine, and he starts taking over the show, uh, the Slappy show. And from that point forward, it's chaos. Um, I guess for my thoughts about the movie, I have to say right away, I think this is a pretty good movie. Um, I think this movie actually works better as a standalone movie, more than being tied to Goosebumps, and I'll go into that for a little bit of detail. I'll first to address the strengths of the movie, to start with some positives. Uh, the three main characters, Champ, Hannah, and Zack, are all a great trio of main characters. Zack, in the face value, is kind of like a basic main character. He's sympathetic. He has some trauma in his life. He has some identity crises. But now you kind of root for him because, to be fair, the, the movie did a pretty good job with his relationship with Hannah because as corny as it sounds, I actually believe that him and Hannah could have been a couple because their uh, chemistry on screen is very well done. They do a good job acting. Dylan Mignette is from um, one of my favorite Haunting Hour episodes called Brush With Madness, so I love seeing him act, and he does a great job here. Um, and Ryan Lee, played by, you know, plays Champ, uh, he's been in a lot of stuff. He was also in Haunting Hour, funny enough, my imaginary, uh, I think my imaginary friend or something. Um, he was also in the Titanium music video. That's a blast from the past. If y'all remember that Titanium music video, you're old as shit like me, all right? So this man, he does a great job. He's genuinely funny. He's genuinely kind of quirky. And he does a good job as like a wingman, you know? And I think they overall are a great pairing for the movie. Another thing that I do enjoy is that some of the monsters, some, I am a fan of, and I think that the movie does a pretty good job. First of all, Lawn Gnomes. Lawn Gnomes is easily, in my opinion, the best villain in this entire movie. Why? Because the Lawn Gnomes sucked in Revenge of the Lawn Gnomes. Y'all seen my roast, most likely. I roasted the hell out of that book. It's trash. The Lawn Gnomes here are actually threatening. They actually do try to kill the main characters, and they're very violent. You get the scene in the kitchen... Basically, Zack starts getting choked out. They try strangling him from a top vantage point in the kitchen. They start throwing knives at him. One jumps on top of R.L. Stein's face and basically tries to gouge his eyes out. There's a lot of crazy stuff. And then R.L. Stein almost gets thrown into the oven and cooked alive. So the threat level of the lawn gnomes in this movie is way better. That whole action scene is fun. The lawn gnomes themselves are a very fun villain here. They look very cute, cuddly, ordinary. Turns out they're extremely vicious and the opposite nature. Really well done stuff. Um, another villain that I surprisingly enjoyed more than I thought I would. And I don't think many people thought I, you know, they would have enjoyed this one. The giant kaiju praying mantis, which is not even a Goosebumps villain. That's from the cover of A Shocker on Shock Street. It's not even relevant to the Goosebumps series aside from Tim Jacobus' artwork. Here is actually a very sinister threat. First of all, I hate bugs. Second off, if y'all have ever seen Joe Rogan, you know praying mantises are the ultimate apex predators of the animal kingdom. These things are terrifying as is when they're this tiny. You get a giant kaiju one tearing apart buses, breaking into buildings. It can fly, man. It can fucking fly, man. It's a genuine threat against the villains. It ends up having a lot of good action scenes. And honestly, my favorite scene is that bus fake-out. That bus fake-out scene involving the praying mantis is extremely well done. That is a really cool fake-out. It was really action-packed, and I enjoyed it quite a bit. So overall, I'd say that the good things about this movie is that if you look at it from an individual standpoint, it's a lot of fun. I think this is a pretty good movie because I can re-watch this movie pretty much every year. I can turn my brain off. I don't have to worry about not having a good time because I think there's a certain charm to it that makes it rewatchable as the years continue. But I would be lying if I said that I didn't think that to a lot of people who say this is one of the best things that ever come out, I think it's overrated. And the main reason I find it overrated is not because of the actual dynamics of the movie. It's because it's tied to the Goosebumps IP. And there are certain things in this movie that kind of annoy me or piss me off. First off, this I might catch flag for y'all. All right, put, put, put the pitchforks down. All right, let me explain. Jack Black is annoying. I'm sorry. Jack Black, he's a great actor. I love Jack Black as a person. He's one of the most iconic celebrities out there. And I think he's honestly wasted in this movie because R.L. Stein's lines in this movie are some of the worst. Not only is R.L. Stein in this movie a one-trick, one-note pony 
He has no character development throughout the entire movie. He just plays the grumpy old man. His lines, a lot of the time, are more cringy than actually funny. You know it's bad when Champ is funnier than R.L. Stein. Champ is genuinely funnier than Jack Black playing R.L. Stein in a movie. That is a concern because Champ is just kind of meant to be cringy. But you actually find him funny because he seems genuine and he actually has a character development hero moment towards the end. R.L. Stein is the same guy throughout the entire movie. He's just complaining. He's kind of annoying. He's kind of bitching. And that's not really what R.L. Stein is. Now, I know they're, they're playing a character. This is not meant to be actually R.L. Stein. But R.L. Stein in real life, he's funny. He's a witty guy. He's very calm in nature. You kind of really like him. You root for him. But at the same time, you respect the man for what he's done. Here, R.L. Stein seems very egotistical. He seems a little pretentious because he's a very eccentric personality. He caused this mess where somehow his books started turning into real life and potentially hurting and killing people in neighborhoods, and he had to lock it away. And then yet he finds a way to blame other people. You're the one who caused this mess, buddy. You, you should be a little bit more sympathetic towards people, but instead he has no development throughout the entire movie. So that's just one nitpick. Second off, this movie does a pretty poor job with the Goosebumps monsters. Now, this may be all chalked up to Letterman. This may be, I don't know, marketability or something. I don't know. But the abominable snowman of Pasadena. I like his design. I like the fact that he's 10 feet tall. I like the fact that he's imposing. This guy gets beat by a couple of kids with hockey sticks, a Zamboni, a vending machine, and a six-foot-tall plexiglass. I mean, this guy is a bumbling idiot. You would expect this 10-foot-tall Yeti to be threatening. You would expect them to put respect on Abominable Snowman's man. No, that man is getting thrown around like a hockey puck. He is a complete joke. And that's when I realized that the movie was kind of going more for a comedic route. Then you got the werewolf of fever swamp in the grocery store. That is some of the worst CGI I've seen in recent years, man. I don't know what it is with the werewolf of fever swamp's budget. His CGI doesn't look good. Oh, yeah. And did I forget to mention? He barks. I'm going to repeat that for y'all just so that sinks in. A werewolf. Half wolf, half man. Barks. Like a fucking chihuahua, man. I, who made that decision? Who decided that the barking werewolf was a good idea, bro? That is the most non-threatening villain I've ever seen in my life. I, you imagine this seven-foot-tall werewolf about to rip you to shreds, and he starts going, oh, oh, oh. I can't take that seriously, bro. You better back the hell up. I'm going to get the shock collar. I'm going to get the shock collar. I'm going to get the dry kibble bits. Your ass is grass, bro. I'm not dealing with you right now. And then he starts doing this fake puss in boot scene where he tries dragging his claws against these two trailers of a semi-truck, thinking he's clean like death. You are not death from puss in boots, bitch. You are not him. You are bootleg. I'm not scared of you, bro. And he's got swim trunks on. He's got swim trunks. You trying to hide that man's junk? I see it. I know why you got to hide the junk. That's the only reason why he's rocking swim trunks. It's a damn werewolf, bro. It's a damn werewolf. I cannot take that seriously. And then you get that stupid scene with Jack Black where he's spraying like 50 pounds of axe all over his body. That's me in the locker room at 13. That was dead ass me. I was pouring the whole thing over me. I got no bitches. That shit was sad as fuck. This movie, bro, it has so many goofy moments. It has so much random stuff in there. Body squeezers. They don't look like body squeezers. You got clowns. I think from, what is it, Clown Street? That dude looks like a ripoff Pennywise. You know, the original Pennywise. Uh, from the 90s or, or 1900s, whatever. That, that that thing doesn't look good, all right? And then you get all these different action scenes that go nowhere. The Welcome to Dead House or whatever, Graveyard Ghouls, they look like zombies you would see in Michael Jackson's Thriller music video. I'm thinking, where the hell is the budget to this movie going? And I realize it's all for that damn praying mantis CGI. So I feel like they misallocated their resources. I feel like they kind of focused on the wrong things. And even though it is an enjoyable movie, I have to say it's overrated. I don't think it's a 10 out of 10. I don't think it's a 9. If you love it for nostalgia, props to you. I mean, I'm happy for you if you love this movie. I can see why some people love this movie. But I've seen too much of this genre to be happy with. All right, I've seen the original Jumanji. And no offense, Zathura. Zathura is the best Jumanji formula, y'all. Zathura is one of the best movies out there. Zathura clears this one. So what do I think about Goosebumps 2015? Overrated, but it's fun. So let me hear y'all thoughts now. Because... That's enough of my rant. 
Bruce, you have anything to add on before I share my thoughts? Uh, are you saying I should go now or? No, yeah, if you have anything to add okay. before I share what I'm going to say. So my unbiased, sorry, my biased self, my younger self, or the one that I just want to view this movie as, kind of wants to go, this is a 10 out of 10 perfect movie. You know, kind of what I used to think it was. This was my favorite movie for a very long time. However, cannot say the same these days. I have a big issue with this movie. It's the only issue I really have besides a couple tiny bits that don't really contribute to my rating. But the thing that just, it it's really, it's really stupid. The first fourth of this movie needs to be chopped in half. I mean, it is a drag. It's boring. It almost goes nowhere most of it. And it's not fun to watch. The, the mom, like, t- saying something about twerking at the school conference, like, okay, I get it. It's supposed to be, like, that cringe funny thing. It's not working. It's It didn't work at the time. It didn't work now. And I feel like, as far as I... I, 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 I do like R.L. Stein. I can even say I think a lot of the people that don't like him, like B.D., I feel like it's because of this first fourth where he's just kind of... I don't want to say swear words, but he's kind of being a bitch. And it's not fun to watch. I mean, the whole time while you're watching this thing, you're just like, okay, when is this going to get over? And honestly, every single rewatch I have done, even as a little kid, uh, well, not little, but even as like a 10-year-old, 11-year-old, I was still thinking that, you know what, I'm going to skip these first, like, five six scenes because they they're fucking boring you don't need it you need the title card and you need the part where he breaks into arl stein's house that's my thoughts the rest of the movie i honestly think is really fun i think that the characters are great i think that the story is a very nicely paced plot i love the way they kind of use that i i know this is criticized a lot i don't know where this term really got popular but I feel like that, like, Jumanji-esque feeling definitely works well for a Goosebumps movie. And I think, although, yes, this is definitely supposed to be kind of a cash grab, I think that it definitely pleased a lot of fans. And I think that this was a better overall way to do it and have a lot of people's favorite monsters, I will get into that, without having to do some enormous, like, three-movie trilogy all based around the same story. I hate when things do that. I'm looking at you fucking fast and furious. But it does get a little messy here. I just said you get to see all the people's favorite monsters. Well, there's also some pretty one. There's some pretty popular ones that were cut out. And I'm not even going to mention them because you already know what they are. And it's really fucking disappointing. Besides that, I think it's honestly a great movie. I come to it a lot, usually once or twice a year. Um, and I guess my thoughts, I'm not going to go into it yet, but I feel like the reason why you'll hear my thoughts on Goosebumps 2 is not because it is it's essentially a bad movie. It's because I don't think that it's trying to do something similar to this in a way. And I don't think people that like the second movie are really um, confident enough to bring up while talking about their love for it but i'll get into that later let's see what completionist has to say okay so um 2015 all right i was 21 years old when this movie came out i was not the age demographic to be honest when i was a kid when i was about the age of 5 to 12 which is the average age for goosebumps it was in 1999 through like 2006 okay you know what I had growing up? I had the original Goosebumps show. I had Are You Afraid of the Dark? I was exposed to The Nightmare Room. I was exposed to countless reruns of these shows. I grew up watching Halloween decoms and all these standalone kids horror movies. I even got to see the, uh, the movie called um, Monster House from 2006, right in the tail end of my middle school years. I went to see that movie like 15 times in the theater. I paid many times to go see it. And I loved that movie because it felt like it was filling a void during a time where Goosebumps wasn't releasing any new content. So 
I can totally see the importance of 2015 and what that means to younger fans, especially fans that grew up not exactly reading Horrorland, but they were born around when Horrorland came out. <laughs> and so, like, if I don't, I don't think if you were a person that grew up with the original 62 series 2000, I've actually had conversations with people who were like, you know, around the age of 10 or 12 when Horrorland came out. I think that the movie kind of missed the boat for everything from Horrorland previous for people. I, I don't think it clicked for those for those longer there fans, essentially. But these newer newer kids, it, it seems like this movie really resonates with them. So I can't speak on that and what that means. I totally get it though. However, looking at 2015, I've seen I grew up with movies. Like I said, I was in that age demographic. I saw Jumanji many times. I saw Sathura when it came out in the theaters. When I first watched this movie, it was about a year or two after it came out. And I was like, this basically is that, just with themed like Goosebumps. And I didn't really care for it all that much, like to think about it that much. But as time has gone on, and I've, as I've reacquainted myself with Goosebumps over the years, and I got back into my love of the books and the source material, I can't help but look at this movie and just say, this is not a Goosebumps movie. This is a movie themed like goosebumps and there's a big delineation in how i judge that it doesn't feel like a book it doesn't feel like what i like from goosebumps it's just there and um sadly that's how i still feel about it you know we already talked about the plot of the story uh, i think bruce hit the nail on the head for me i whenever i put this movie on i have about a 50 50 shot of falling asleep and normally it's within that first 20 minutes it is boring as hell i'm not gonna lie it is not entertaining I think they really mishandled Jack Black. I, I think he was a poor cast to be Arl Stein to begin with. I would have cast maybe somebody like Larry David from Curb Your Enthusiasm. Just put, dye his hair black, put a nose prosthetic. He would have been a perfect Arl Stein. But they chose Jack Black. And I'm like, okay, let's see what they do with this goofy guy. He was in Tenacious D. He was in a couple things I've seen in the past. And they make him an ass. Like he's just a jerk though for like the first quarter of the movie for no reason. He's unlikable. And the whole child abuse thing, you're like, okay, where are they going with this? And you realize when the girl's name is Hannah and why she's trapped in the house when you see a cuckoo clock, it's kind of obvious. And it, especially if you've seen the movie before, when you go back to watch, you're like, oh, that's what they're going at. And it makes the reveal not as good in hindsight. You know what I mean? I, I guess the first time you watch it, you might be mind blown with that, but it's it's there. <laughs> You know, but I, I do like the concept here. I do think there's some salvageable things. You have Arl Stein's house. You have all these Goosebumps books. It's meta. It's 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 aware for the fans. They're making a movie as fan service. They but but when you have a whole library of Goosebumps books and you only tackle a handful, I get it for budget. But look, tell me how random do these books sound? Why did some of these books get picked? Okay, Invasion of the Body Squeezers. Please don't feed the vampire. Haunted car. What is prompting them to choose these books? I don't know. We have Abominable Snowman of Pasadena uh, as like a giant monster freak. You mean to tell me that out of all the characters they're going to pick from, you know, Dr. Brewer, uh, the, the Dark Falls Denizens, Monster Blood even, you, you mean to tell me somebody said, no, we're going to put the snowman in this movie. Why? I, then, I'd rather I'd rather see the lamp in page forty two of Werewolf of Beaver Swamp. <laughs> I mean, and, and speaking of that, BB brought up uh, the CGI, the CGI of these monsters. You, you know, here's the thing: I've heard people say in the past about different scenarios. You know, as longtime fans of what we would have hypothetically liked to see for this movie, I, I brought up maybe we could have had a creep show style anthology. People have said maybe Arl Stein could have wrote stories and they could have adapted original stories for goosebumps as films and marketed that way that stein was making brand new goosebumps content strictly for movies i think that either of those could have been a better alternative but i do think that even if that was the case the cgi still would have been there <laughs> and that's you can tell they put a lot of focus on that and probably spent majority of their budget there Hence why we didn't get that many monsters in the movie. Very rarely did you see a monster with like typical effects that weren't enhanced by CGI. I think Slappy had a had a had a prop, but they enhanced him. 
the body squeezers were enhanced. The only characters that weren't enhanced, I think, was the clown and whoever played the um, mummy woman from Return of the Mummy. I forget her name. Other than that, everything was CGI, it appears, minus some brief shots. If you blink, if you, you'll miss it. In the giant crowd that were these monsters in the climax. I mean, Haunted Mask infamously got a scene in this movie, and they cut it out. How do you make Haunted Mask a cameo and then cut it out to begin after the fact? That's insulting. Do you th- I just feel like they're, they're disjointed even with trying to provide fan service. They're just picking random crap and trying to make it cool. And I, that, that's why you see, you know, the Lawn Gnomes, I think, got more popular after the movies. Because when I was a kid, Lawn Gnomes was made fun of. You got made fun of if you liked that book. After the movie, now it was cool to like Lawn Gnomes. I mean, it has that effect, kind of similar to some episodes from the old show. But getting past that, if I'm just going to base this on, like, a story merit, this is going from a kid's horror IP and then inserting tropes that we see in common, common movies, left and right, family adventure movies. You know, it has the typical Jumanji in Zathura idea, except without the without the iconic Jumanji opening. You know what made Jumanji iconic from the beginning? You get into Alan Parrish's backstory and how horrific that was when he found the Jumanji board game and how he's playing it with a girl and how it sucks him into the, the game. That catches you up to present day. You know what to you know what to expect. This board game is dangerous. This movie starts out with a generic sad boy montage where he's going to a new town. Take a shot if you've ever seen that in a movie. He's at his house. Uh, he has a crush on the girl next door. Take a shot if you've ever seen that in a movie. Um he has a coming of age storyline. Tell me that you haven't seen that in another movie of the similar genre. It's just trope after trope after trope, just with the goosebumps skin on it. Okay. The humor is funny. I think the writing is clever with certain characters. Champ played by Ryan Lee. Very good. Um, I like Zach's character. I think he's nice, even though he's kind of generic. He does have an arc and he's likable. That's all you really need. Hannah, intriguing. I like her, the angle they took with her and some thought-provoking stuff dealing with how Arl Stein holds her captive along with all of his other creations in his home. I think that's very poetic, and I think that feeds into a nice ending. I do think that some of the monsters were more intimidating than their book counterparts, like the blob even. We actually get to see more blob action than we got to see in the book. We got lawn gnomes that are actually a threat and not just some goofy villains playing pranks on people. I mean, good stuff when it is there. At the end of the day, the movies that it's trying to emulate, it's the same old thing. A person comes across something, they activate said thing, it comes out in the real world, they have to figure out how to stop it and end it and uh, put it all back inside the box. Jumanji, Zathura, Goosebumps 2015. Same idea, same concept at the end of the day. It feels like I've I've watched three movies in a row. (laughs) of the same concept uh, and that's why i just don't feel strong about this like i think it's a fine film if i'm gonna rate this thing i probably get like a three and a half out of five stars uh which is still a, like a low good um but it's not something like i it's not, it's not something i go around recommending to people and i can totally see why fans that were reading horrorland or prior were upset with this movie because it, it's a letdown quite frankly and ever since then kids horror movies themselves have suffered because of this movie's success. Basically, the old idea of how kids' horror movies were set up died after this movie. There was a string of knockoffs. I mean, even Goosebumps 2 Haunted Halloween felt they needed to kind of go back and retread some of these ideas, and then we got knockoffs of that movie. I mean, I would have much rather seen something different personally, uh, but like I said early on, I understand what this means for younger fans. I'm not going to dunk on you for liking the movie. I get it. Uh, it's just not for me. Do you have something you want to add? Yeah, I was going to say that I think also another generational divide where, like, me and completionists don't like this movie as much as younger fans do is because if you think about it, like, let's say Bruce, for example. Bruce is experiencing this as his gateway into Goosebumps. So you get this action-packed movie, you have a fun idea, and then from that point forward, he can then go into detail about each book that he's never read. So when he sees certain monsters and picks them out, he can go, okay, let me read the book on that. And he finds out about the lore and origin, about what it used to be. 
for me and completionists, we grew up watching the OG Goosebumps show. We grew up reading some of the older books. So hearing that the first Goosebumps movie is going to be made after how many delays and obstacles this whole idea has faced across the years, a lot of people had high expectations for it. Even me, I want to bring up the fact that at one point, there was going to be an old Goosebumps movie made of Welcome to Dead House, my favorite OG 62 book done by George Romero, the horror icon and legend, the movie legend George Romero was going to make a darker, a darker version of Welcome to Dead House, which would have genuinely, I think if that would have came out, that would have genuinely terrified kids. It would have done the same effect, scary stories of telling the dark and other stuff did for us, genuinely raised the, the standard of kids' horror tremendously if that would have came out. That never happened. It went down the gutter. That was a lost media idea. Then you have R.L. Stein discussing how there has been a plethora, a plethora of scripts that have been recycled, thrown out, recycled, thrown out. It, he was talking about in an interview he did in New York um, where he was basically saying that there's been several scripts that have had completely different ideas, modifications, they all got thrown out. Then you finally get the end product. And it's like Jumanji. It's like Zathura. It felt like a cop-out to what could have been something creative. And for me, I don't like using this word, but it definitely feels to me like a normie Goosebumps movie, which might have been what they were aiming for. But it feels very much like they took the easy route. And the easy route is fine, but it didn't push the needle. It kept the needle right where it is. And people were disappointed by that because we could have had something creative. We could have had quality put into it instead of quantity. And instead they chose to just do it, you know, the easy way. And then to me, as, as a Jumanji format movie, it's not that good because Jumanji has a cohesive story, the first one. Then you have Zathura. Zathura is a cohesive movie. It has character development. It has... Um, the main character seeing a future version of himself. You have Zorgons, you have robots limited to two monsters who play a prominent role. And it has genuinely well done scenes. Y'all remember the dumbwaiter scene in Zathura with the Zorgons at the furnace? Genuinely terrifying, intense, horrifying. Is any scene in Goosebumps 2015 scaring you? I, I would vote no. Even for the kids watching, no. It feels more like an adventure movie than it does actually a kids horror movie. So even though it's fun, it's a goosebumps. We want to be scared. We want to be impressed. And I think that's why there's a general divide because you have either people who are seeing it for the first time going, wow, this is what goosebumps is. Let me check it out. And then you have goosebumps veterans who have been into it for a while, just sitting there and going, that's what they did with it. So that's my perspective on it. Bruce, do you have something you want to add? No, I'm good. I'm good. You good? <laughs> well, here's one, one more thing to add to that, right? The opening scene in Jumanji, I think, is scarier than anything in 2015. And I think what what really hurts that movie, and I think it's, you know, a product of its time, unfortunately, is the, is you know, we already talked about the CGI, but it's also the reliance on the like, family-friendly stuff. Like, back in the day, they, were, they weren't afraid to actually put some grit into some family movies, especially in Jumanji. When you look at some of the stuff there, they have a hunter with a gun with a musket shooting at kids. Like... That would never fly in today, probably. So, looking at this movie, and uh, I mean, you can you can see the love letter, I, I guess, with like the characters named Zach and Champ. That's obviously a love letter to Zachy Bochamp, who was the main character in Blah That Did Everyone. Um, that that character is commonly contributed to being the most like R.L. Stein or one of the more relatable Goosebumps characters. So I, I can see that there, and I can see that they tried at least to look into the source material. Um, but that ties back to my point, and I kind of feed onto what BD said about they're going into the adventure movie side, not really being scary. It's getting further and further away from what the source material was. Goosebumps is a kids' horror anthology show. It's an anthology book series. It is not a family adventure movie that could be passable in something of a repertoire that you would see back in the day on 20th Century Fox with, like, Free Willy. Honestly, Free Willy might have had more scary scenes with Shamu than this movie. So there you go. Bruce, you have something you want to add? I'm sorry. Um, this is so fucking controversial, but I feel like I have to say it. this kind of tying into what BD said is like 
the Metallica Black album of Goosebumps. It's like the thing that got a whole new generation of fans. Their other stuff, although it was definitely very, very popular, I still think that without this movie, Goosebumps would still be kind of in that, you know, barely hanging on, if even available at all. I think it would have stopped at, like, Most Wanted era. But, um, oh, man. I also have to add about Jack Black. I was just thinking about it. I'm like, now I'm kind of starting to see the complaints with his casting because we've seen him in other movies like School of Rock where he's trying to, he's playing, like, a very likable character. Although he's very out there, he's very likable in that movie. And in here, uh, although I think he actually is likable towards the latter half, I think that in this first half, yeah, I kind of see the complaints. I think he's kind of a douche. I don't see much fun watching him. I don't want to restate everything I already said, but yeah, that's kind of what I had to add. I just want to I want to also add on that that Bruce is right because it, it did help the popularity. You know why I know that? I, I had to look up the Werewolf and Fever Swamp grocery store clip um, for a little meme that I made on my channel. It has 525 million views. Taylor Swift, eat your heart out. A Goosebumps clip has more views than your music videos do. Uh, so that is quite impressive. Also, since Jack Black is a douche in this movie, you can say he's a skadoosh. Sorry. So, okay, I think we're all in a similar consensus. I think the movie's fine in like that like good way, right? BD, you said the movie. You think the movie's good, but overrated. And then Bruce said you, you like it, but you have some nostalgia bias with it. And you're open and honest about it, and you think it is flawed in some areas, like the first quarter. Uh, so it's not it's not a perfect movie. I think we can all say that it has some flaws. Um, some some flaws. People, I guess Bruce's generation grew up with CGI, so I don't know if he actually finds that to be an issue. That that'll be something to you know chime in, Bruce, if you have an issue with CGI. I will say, when you're a little kid, you don't know what CGI is. You know, you don't know these terms. Looking back on it, it's um, quite interesting. And I honestly, much, I much rather would have had them cut down the monster amounts and just had practical effects. Because <laughs> it gets so bad. Especially at these, like, at the campfire scene, you're like, what the fuck am I looking at? It's like pixelated. It's some parts it's fine, some parts it's it's a disaster. But See, yeah, yeah, to chime in, they could have done like the graveyard ghouls, the body squeezers, oh yeah, and like some terrifying like like group think villains. They could have done swarms of body squeezers, swarms of uh, undead zombies, and something else. Maybe lawn gnomes. Mildly CGI'd, of course, and then had the giant praying mantis, maybe the haunted car, and Slappy. And I think that would have been fine, you know, just stick with a smaller cast and focus on those characters. I think the inconsistencies are super weird of how they change villains and how they look because I think the show, sorry, the movie producers and writers were like not actual fans because they went, oh, zombies, easy way to make, you know, Goosebumps Monster. Yeah, that's not in the book. That's just not in the book at all. It's a cover thing. I think the cover was made way before the book even was written at all. It's like spirits. This book is about, like, body transforming and stuff, or, like, possessing. Uh, it's just random things like this, and kind of like what BD said earlier. The body squeezers, dude. What are those things? I mean, they look <laughs> fine. But I didn't know they were body squeezers, and I'm not even kidding, until three months ago. I looked it up. I saw I saw a picture. I said, when someone told me, Invasion of the Body Squeezers in the Goosebumps movie, I'm like, what? No, they were not. And I was proven wrong. They are. But am I really being proven wrong? They barely look like them. They don't even... I haven't read the book in forever, but they don't even... I don't even think they use guns. Do they use guns? Or do they have, like, metal on them? I remember them just being, like, aliens. And I think that they had, like, weird hands and shit. So, the the weird changes, I'm not a big fan of either. And it all ties in back with the... It, it ties in back with the CGI stuff. 
the one time they use practical effects for the zombies, it's like, dude, that's the one time you want CG. You want CG spirits. Possess the characters for a fun little scene. This is overall supposed to be a comedy, right? How about we have a funny possessing scene? That'd be hilarious. I think that's a very missed opportunity. Even with my somewhat passion and love for that graveyard scene, however, it's overall not that special. I think that it's just more unnecessary teen drama, which I think, if I'm not mistaken, Rob Letterman was also attached to the 2023 project. Mm-hmm. I think that um, I think that dude. I think he really, I think he really likes teenage dramas. I really think he does melodramas. Dude probably gets off to that at night. I don't know. <laughs> and one last thing to chime in uh, before we move on to Goosebumps Two Haunted Halloween. You know, fruit for thought. What I think would have been a fun idea, right, is if we're going to go the whole meta thing with Goosebumps, at least be aware that Stein kind of took some ideas from existing things and put a tweak on it and then made it something something different out of it in Goosebumps. What I would have loved to see, if we have the blob from the blob they did everyone, try to homage some scenes that were in that 80s blob movie. If we have zombies, try to replicate a George Romero zombie chase scene. Or... If we have aliens, you could do the whole Night of the Creeps scenario where you have the three kids standing in the middle of a courtyard and you have all these alien-possessed creatures or the body squeezers, because if you don't know what the body squeezers do, um, well, you should know by now, but you you can have the body squeezers doing things to people around the courtyard and then witnessing this and trying to steal their guns or something or gadgets to help them get out of the situation. It's not as immersive as you would think. The most thing interactions we get with monsters, you got kids running away from a werewolf at a grocery store. You got uh, a, a weird kooky thing at an ice rink with the Yeti monster from Snowman of Pasadena. And uh, the lawn gnomes wreaking havoc in a kitchen. Okay? Uh, and, and I'm not saying that's not a problem in the second movie. Trust me, it still is the, a similar issue there too. Uh, but it, it could have been played up in a little more horrific way and not that tongue-in-cheek corny family adventure movie way you know there's there's missed opportunities with this movie and the movie next and i think that's a good segue because now we have goosebumps 2 haunted halloween and uh bd if you want to take this over uh what do you think about goosebumps 2 haunted halloween off the bat and tell us about the movie okay so off the bat if you are a slappy fan and you don't like this movie you're a fraud your social credit score is going down immediately. You cannot take out a loan. You're a fraud. Scammer. Because why? This is Slappy's best portrayal. So let me go into a little bit of the plot synopsis. So the story starts off with Sarah. Now, Sarah is actually a um, teenager. She's a senior, and she's about to go into a college. So you actually get an older girl perspective on beginning off the movie, which is a little bit interesting. And she's basically trying to write an essay because she has to write her final essay. And, of course, the essay... Now, this is a little bit on the nose, but it's about, I guess, the one time she's been afraid in her life. So the scariest moment in her life. Let that be a little bit of foreshadowing. And essentially, as she's writing this essay, um, a guy that she's interested in comes through the window and he basically um, tells her, you know, I got tickets to this one concert. Um, You and I can go. You potentially find out it might be her love interest and that Halloween is actually coming up. So that's going to be the big setting of the movie. However, her mom ends up breaking into her room and you end up finding out a little bit about the family. The mom is very overprotective, a very strong woman, and she tries to keep all of her kids in kind of line and keep them all together. You have uh, Sarah's younger brother named Sonny. Sonny, a little bit of an overweight kid. You can tell he's not that popular. He gets bullied quite a bit, but he's a really smart kid. This kid is really smart. He has a, you know, a knowledge for science. Um, he's about to show off for a little bit of a I guess science fair, science show, kind of inside of his chemistry class. He wants to make a Tesla tower, and he's very interested in creating that. So you kind of get this inventor kid angle, which I think is pretty interesting. I kind of like the inventor kid angle that they take for uh, the main character. I'm a, Personally, I'm a huge fan of Meet the Robinson, one of the best animated movies out there. I love that movie's morals, so seeing this guy kind of emulate that a little bit is very cool. Um, and you get introduced to Sam. Sam is Sonny's best friend. And they basically, as a subplot, have a uh, garbage collection crew, which I think called the Junk Bros. And it, I think their tagline is, we grab your junk, pause, double pause, 
triple pause. So y- y'all telling me, right? So y'all telling me you got the script. You, you, you wrote that. I'm, I, I think they knew what they were doing, bro. I think they knew what they were doing. If you didn't, I saw someone needs to talk to an executive writer there. But they basically got the subplot. They go pick up antique junk. And they end up going to this kind of like abandoned house down the suburb. And uh, what do you know? Who is this abandoned house belong to? It's Mr. R.L. Stein. Jack Black and Hannah have moved away. Um, you don't know why they moved away. A little, little bit of a convenience sub, sub point. You know, you, you don't know what happened to that family. They're just completely gone. But there is a one urban thing, legend. One thing. It's a different town in Goosebumps, too. Oh. Just so you oh, know. Oh. Yeah. Oh, e- even more. Even more. Different town. There you go. Uh, they didn't really care. They didn't really care, did they? Um, the fact that R.L. Stein somehow was able to teleport into a different town and still have an urban legend surrounding the house. Uh, they basically have a little bit of an urban legend. It's kind of like a haunted house. It, it's said to be like, you know, kind of a little bit dangerous. It, it's kind of like they treat it a little bit like it's a serial killer's house, which is a little bit weird to me. They treat it like there's been some unknown atrocities that happened in this house. And then you, if for anyone who's seen Goosebumps 2015, you're like, yeah, no, no, it's it's not that deep. Uh, they go inside the house, and then guess what? You find a briefcase. What's in that briefcase? None other than Mr. Slampy himself. And they, of course, find his card. They read out his information. And uh, when they read out his information, they decide to put him in his wagon. And they say, you know what? We're going to take Slappy home. This junk is for us. Let's take him. It might be pretty cool to have a ventriloquist dummy. And as they're leaving, some bullies that are always tormenting these guys show up, basically show up on their bikes, try to act real tough, try to act like they're about to beat up these kids and steal their stuff. And then uh, let's just say uh, a certain dummy, not not the bullies in this case, but a certain dummy starts messing with them and starts using telekinesis, different powers, and really starts to uh, save the kids. And when Sonny and Sam get back to their house, uh, they basically find out Slappy is alive. This little code that we all know, Karu Mario Donna, it's brought him to life. And Slappy is quite intimidating, much, much like in the beginning of 2015, where he had reverse flash level hyper speed. He's got super speed here. He can teleport. He's got telekinesis, very manipulative. And yet, despite being so threatening, Slappy has a very unique perspective in this movie, which is that he wants to start a family. And I thought that was really interesting to see because Slappy books can often be very formulaic and boring. I know Michael Goosebumps fan is crying out there right now. I'm sorry, Mike. These books can be very formulaic and boring a lot of the time. And here, they take a different angle. Slappy wants a family. Slappy actually wants compassion. He wants to create bonds with people. And he start raising some eyebrows. You start hitting the rock face. You're like, well, what's about to go on here? And he starts building a connection with Sonny. He starts helping him out in some uh, stuff. And what ends up happening is that eventually Slappy tags along with them to school. And Sarah ends up seeing that her potential lover, her potential boyfriend, actually ends up cheating on her. And that's when Slappy starts taking things into his own matters. And my God, that auditorium scene is one of the scariest Slappy scenes I have ever seen tied to Goosebumps Media. That man was threatening. That man physically hurt a person, broke his arm, and then stood over there menacingly just taunting him and saying, you don't mess with my big sister. And if you ever do that again, you know what's coming to you. I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. What is the side of Slappy? And as the story goes on, he becomes hyper obsessive over this family. And let's just say they try to get rid of him. And after that, Slappy decides, you know what? If my family is ungrateful, this town is going to learn its lesson. And he decides to highlight that on Halloween. So that's basically the plot synopsis. How do I feel about this one? Well, first of all, I don't know what y'all are smoking. Listen, man, DMT is not for everybody. I know Joe Rogan says he smokes it, goes into the water cryo chamber, starts having the time of his life. He starts talking about chimpanzees and Komodo dragons. Not everybody has a Jamie pull that up. You don't all have that. You don't got the million dollar (laughs) Spotify deal. That's not making you money. Put down the DMT, y'all. Who said that this movie was worse than 2015? Y'all are for real high. I'm talking about Jupiter. I'm talking about, you know, in space when planets give off frequencies, y'all think the planets are talking to you and Jupiter is saying some bullshit to you right now because there's no way you think that this movie is worse than 2015. If you're a Slappy fan, Slappy in this movie 
is intimidating. He's got aura. This man's like a damn anime villain. I thought this man was about to turn into Vegito, go Super Saiyan in a second. This man is ready to go. He's got superpowers. He's threatening. He's hurting people. He's got a family angle. I, I mean, listen, we reread Bride of the Living Dummy. That man didn't take the family angle in that one. He took the love tap, still little girl. The man was not cooking that time. He's cooking in this one. He wants a family. You, you could honestly, honestly, the first half of this movie, before Halloween takes off, Stein could have adapted it into a book, like Family of the Living Dummy or, you know, Dummy Reunion or something like that. You know, it, it could be its own slappy story, and it's really well done. He's genuinely terrifying. He's got a bunch of different powers. You genuinely are scared of slappy. He's not just sitting there in a corner of a room staring at you, looking whatever. He's not in 2015 where he's just moving around, hopping in the whip like he's like a pimp, like just driving a haunted car and throwing out flaming books. He's not doing that. He's actually moving the environment. He's actually manipulating people. He's actually bringing things to life. He's actually preying upon this family, blackmailing them. He even rizzes up their mom. I was like, how is this man spitting game at a human woman? Th this woman is down bad, first of all. Second of all, the man is a player. I don't know how Slappy pulled that off. That's the best feat Slappy's ever done in his entire life. The fact that he pulled a grown-ass woman who that too got nursed. She got guap too. She got money. Listen, man, Slappy is a, a jewel in this movie. And for me, a, a guy who often shits on Slappy, a guy who often is known as a, a Slappy hater in the streets, maybe 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 not accurate. Well, it, it is accurate, but I don't want to admit it. I'm, I'm a little bit of a Slappy hater sometimes. He genuinely impressed me in this movie. And then you get to Halloween. Listen, man, I know Completionist is a fan of Halloween Town. I know Bruce's opinion on Halloween Town. We're going to skip over that. I like my boy. I don't want to roast him right now. Halloween Town is that good shit, y'all. I grew up watching Halloween Town. That's that good. And this is a horror a horror version of Halloween Town. You got all these fun monsters. You got witches. You got mummies. You got the headless horseman, like a sleepy hollow up in here, running around. You got that giant balloon spider on top of that Asian comedian's house. I forgot the Asian comedian's name. He's funny. I love seeing him in a bunch of different movies just because he's unapologetically himself. He's a treat in this one. Um, seeing all that stuff gone in Halloween is really fun. And the best part of this movie that I was like, yo, this is genuinely, and I know I know Rob Letterman was not involved with this one. It's someone else. Completionist, the encyclopedia will know who's involved. When he reminds me, I will give my praises to them because they impressed me this movie. This man, Slappy, decides he's going to use the Tesla Tower in the town to amplify his power across the town and basically like animate all these objects. So Slappy naturally has all these abilities, and he says, you know what, I'm going to find a power amp and then use that to change, you know, basically the neighborhood. What type of diabolical, I'm talking despicable me, I'm talking, you know, mega mind, like what type of diabolical timing is Slappy on here? I've never seen that level of, I guess, care put into a movie in terms of a villain. Now, is it logical? No. Is it cool sounding? Yeah, it's really dope. And even though the characters in this movie are a weakness, they're not as good as 2015, I'll admit it. They're very basic. They don't have the charm. They don't have the relatability or layers, mostly because it's a younger cast. The older cast was in the first movie. I think that the plot of this movie carries it. I think that this is a fun plot. I think that it's a scary plot. And honestly, the first half genuinely feels like a Goosebumps book. And the second half feels like 2015, except you know what? I'm going to say it. It feels better than 2015 in certain regards because 2015's biggest issue was that, like we brought up, there's all these monsters and, and you want to recognize them and you want to enjoy them, but th they feel half-assed. And honestly, 2015's problem is that, like the body squeezers, they don't look like the body squeezers. And then, or, or you'll have the you know these zombies coming out of the graveyard and then R.L. Stan would be like, oh, it's the graveyard ghouls. That is not the graveyard ghouls, bro. That's like your mom getting you dominoes. She says, oh, oh don't worry, honey. I'm going to order you dominoes. And she puts a party pizza in the oven. And you eat that shit and it tastes like ketchup, ketchup and Crayola, bro. Like, I'm not eating that. That's not dominoes. Don't lie to me, bro. That's what R.L. Stein is doing in the first movie. That is not body squeezers, bro. That That is SpongeBob when he takes off his body and it's just that long stick with the brain sticking out. That's SpongeBob, bro. That's not the body squeezers. Don't lie to me. But here in the movie, they don't got to lie to you. There's no recognizable villain. It's all unique. It's all on some Halloween Town vibes. And Slappy, who we all recognize, is at his peak here. 
Um, and I do have to say, I'm sorry, Jack Black. Jack Black got did dirty this movie. I am sorry. I will pay my, even though I just chat talk you, I, I have to appreciate, you know, the fact that he still managed to show up 10 minutes for a paycheck. I would have not done it, but he does a good job for what he does. All right. So shout out to him. But I want to hear y'all thoughts. All right, Bruce, you want to go first? Yeah, sure. So I'd kind of like to start off by saying it's a more kids horror vibe plot. It has a Goosebumps-ish story. It feels like a kids horror book. And it's fine. The movie's fine. It's basically what I expected upon rewatch. It's a kids horror Goosebumps homage movie that, although definitely different from the first movie, I have a big issue that I'm going to talk about, which is, I think some people that act like this movie is so damn creative, and it's just, like, way better than the first movie. The one thing I have to say against that is that this movie, although Completionist already mentioned this, borrows a lot of stuff that was in the first movie. Uh, I'm not going to really go into detail, but there's a lot of stuff that I can see similarities between, and I'm like, this isn't that much different, and you're making this huge argument about it. It's like, it's fine until you realize, well, if you really think about it, this is the same issue that's in Goosebumps 2. So you, and usually people that like Goosebumps 2 don't like the first one that much. That's kind of where I'm leading to. I feel like that <laughs> the fans of this movie don't have the confidence to really mention those issues and it gets kind of ridiculous to hear after a while now another rant i have to go on is that there are some little boys online little girls that are like this movie sucks this movie's the worst movie i've ever seen this movie's a zero out of ten bs i'm just going to admit it right here i'm not a huge fan of this movie it's not a zero out of ten it's not even a one out of ten it's not a two out of ten it's i wouldn't even say a five I think that the movie is just fine. I don't think that people should hate on this that much. And I think the whole reason they hate on it is because they aren't real fans. I know that sounds really bad. And I apologize. You might not be one of those people if you still agree with what I'm about to say. But I see this come up so much. And y'all, this is basically a Goosebumps book. I mean, if we're really admitting it, it's basically a Goosebumps book. Except kind of like a dummy book mixed with some other stereotypical stuff that you'll see in I'm gonna be honest it kind of feels like a series 2000 in a way I feel like uh this book honestly sorry this movie I'm I'm sorry it's actually pretty similar I feel like this movie is not half bad and I feel like the people that hate on it are just you know what suckers for the first movie and I think that's unfair. I think that the first movie, although different, uh, definitely deserves its hype, in my opinion. I think that this is, that's not an excuse to say this movie sucks. I think, though, that I have my set of issues. I think that the characters are definitely a step down. They are not that great. I think that the acting is also subpar. I think that the way the story moves is not very clean like it did in the first film. I think that you know, it overall just has a vibe that feels missing. It has a gear that's missing for me. Now, that's not to say I love—I don't love some parts, because I really like the Halloween. I mean, you can just look around. I really like the Halloween vibes. I really like the Halloween aesthetic. It reminds me of things like the Scream Team or When Good Ghouls Go Bad, to name a couple. I really like it. And it feels like this movie was genuinely made by a Goosebumps fan. Now, I'm not trying to say that this person has read all of the books, knows a lot about stuff like Completionist has, but I do think that they definitely have read a few, at least, slappy books, and I think they overall have read a lot of Goosebumps. Maybe they've watched a bunch of the TV shows, because there's a lot of stuff in here that feels more faithful and true to the IP than it does in that first movie. Now... There is another set of issues I have. I mean, I don't love the teen drama stuff, and that happens again. It just gets fucking old after a while. I'm sorry to admit it, it just does. 
I think that there's other parts that are like, why is this in here? I don't like the Tesla stuff, although it has its set of fans. I think that it's kind of dumb, and I think it's kind of unnecessary. I think it works until it gets overused. And overall, people will kind of dog on the first film for, you know, choosing, like, mid monsters that no one cares about in Goosebumps. Why cho- why choose these? You could choose better ones. Well, folks, one of the big issues I have in this movie, it's not going to impact this score too much, but it is an issue, is, well, it, it, half of these monsters aren't Goosebumps monsters, and that's fine, but you got to make them kind of good or cool. And I hate seeing, again, only having Slappy being the talker. Now, I know it, he's not all monsters are going to talk. Like, it's kind of weird. But they'll randomly have just a bunch of Halloween decorations. And just by some chance, there's Goosebumps masks and stuff. And Slappy brings them to life. So what is going on here? And that's another issue I have. <laughs> there's a lot of issues. Is that it, it's the movie is trying to find its place in the timeline. Is this a prequel? Is this a sequel? Is this a... What, when does this take place compared to the first film? That's, I mean, it is a huge distraction that I basically never see myself getting over. I think that it's very big to my score. Overall, I'm probably going to lean this one towards like a 6.5 or a 7. It's decent. However, it's not one I come back to much. And especially compared to the first film, which I think is just dumb fun turn off your brain at this point. This feels more like it's trying to grasp your attention more. Uh, but it doesn't succeed in doing it very well. I don't find myself like wanting to watch this movie very much. And a lot of the parts are just kind of laughable. And that's my thoughts. Okay. Um... Well, to kind of add on to what's already been discussed, um, my take with this is that at the heart of it, I was kind of annoyed with how every day the first movie felt to like a bunch of other family adventure movies out there. Um, it has bar, it has a lot of tropes. In this movie, I do see them trying to create something different a little bit, and I'm not saying that I'm not the type of person that says different automatically means good. But they definitely did not go down the trope avenue too much with this because you have a girl looking to go to college, but she's also kind of held back by a relationship and she's kind of contemplating that. It has this coming-of-age rom-coms kind of start to it or maybe this, uh, I don't know, John Hughes 80s teen drama going on, which I which I kind of like. It has that vibe going for it. And then these two characters, what is it, Sam and Sonny? They're, they have the hobby that you would see kids do in a Goosebumps book. It catches me into that. I'm like, oh, I, I see where this is going. They find a house with a Slappy doll. They read the, the spell. It comes alive. Feels like a Slappy book. Even though I've said it in the past, Slappy and how he's become the face of Goosebumps, especially since Rob Letterman and Sony have just made everything Slappy focused since 2015, I can see people revisiting this movie and kind of hating the fact that Slappy's in it and the main villain. But in this, in this story specifically, I have to agree with BD compared to all the other Slappy stuff we've got. This story tries something new with him. It makes him compelling. He has new powers. There's abilities that make him actually threatening. He's manipulating people. He has all the best qualities that we saw in dummy threes episode and he has all the best qualities that we've seen in books like Night of the Living Dummy 2, where you combine what's been missing all these years. You've, we've never had a book or anything where I've seen a good combination of both traits of Slappy. This is the perfect example of that, where you get basically almost peak Slappy. And I have to I have to agree with BD. How he's displayed in the story is fun. I mean, I like the Tesla Tower tie-in because it has payoff. I, that stuff I look for in a book. It's not it's not some su- superfluous item that never gets touched on again. It, it actually matters plot wise. Slappy puts like basically MCU villain level consideration 
into what he's doing in the final act. He's had all this stuff set up. He's got all these traps for these characters. He's prepared for them. I mean, you cannot beat this version of Slappy. He's very entertaining in this. Now, before I start gloating it too much and start overhyping it, let me get some negatives out there because I think it'll be fair. And I think it's, I'll, I think both of you would agree with this. First things first, the second half of the movie is going down that forceful retread of the first a little bit. And what I mean by that is not only do we have more meta stuff this time, except now we have goosebumps in grocery stores and costumes, but we get reused CGI monsters of the Werewolf of Fever Swamp and the Snowman of Pasadena. On top of that, we have scenes where we have new monsters like the Gummy Bears. While it's fun and cool, it's trying to emulate what the Lawn Gnome scene was doing in that first movie. It's almost kind of the same premise and idea, except different rooms and different things that the Gummy Bears are doing. Um, there are new monsters, though, even though they don't really matter that much. They don't have a book or fan base about, around them. They're just there in the story. Um, that's also kind of a detriment in a way. If you if you aren't looking uh, at these monsters in like a fun, exciting way of just seeing new monsters, uh, they could have easily put something else there. If we're going to have meta goosebumps with costumes, why not have Goosebumps animatronics at least and put some new monsters that we didn't get to see in the first movie? I get the inverse argument. Um, I think there is some wasted potential there. Um, and honestly, the characters, I think you're all right on the money. Sonny, Sam, and Sarah, while they're not terrible, in my opinion, they're not bad. They're not as relatable or, I guess, lovable as the first group of kids, which is fair to say. Uh, these, you know... <sighs> You do feel some empathy for Sarah, for what happens with that piece of crap guy. You do feel that she's kind of on that verge of going into something new, but she has one last adventure going for her here, and she has something to, I guess, empower her and make her move past her wanting to be with a guy, and now she's ready to go to college. That's there in the story. And I think Sonny and Sam, they do have some fun moments. It's not all a wash with their characters, Honestly, the whole uh, junk bro stuff, that sign is hilarious. And the in the banter with the with the bully where Slappy's pulling his underwear up and down, that was kind of funny. I'm not even gonna lie, and how that plays out where they're chasing them, that was a good scene. It, it, it was it was lighthearted humor that you would see Arl Stein put in a goosebumps book. It felt like Arl Stein would write something like this. It felt authentic, and that's kind of what I wanted out of the first movie that I didn't get. Hence what Bruce Point brought up, going back to the positive. I love that this feels like a book. I love that, that you can visit this movie and you can be like, okay, you could treat it like a slappy book, essentially, uh, with other monsters in there, with some Goosebumps meta and some forced elements from 2015. Um, other than those negatives, I'd probably give this movie about a four, maybe a 4.2 out of five stars. I'm leaning a four, though. Um, it, it's, a, it's a low... Very good movie, in my opinion. I'm not saying that th that's going to be that high for everyone. You know, an 8 out of 10 is kind of generous. But I, I really do enjoy watching this movie. I think it's... I, th I think the, the first half is at least way better than the first movie. It has it has a more compelling story from the jump. And it get, gets you hooked into the story. Um, and then the second half feels more so the same. Maybe not with the huge grand climax that 2015's movie had going for it. I think that was one of the best aspects to it was that final act. Uh, but this still has a badass final act too. I mean, it, it plays up uh, very well. It, it was so, I think, I think it was so easy to see how this could be a good concept that Netflix tried to rip it off uh, with the curse of Bridge Hollow. And I know I brought this movie up in the past. If y'all have never seen that movie, you go watch it. And I guarantee you, right after you watch, you're going to be like, man, Netflix tried to rip Goosebumps off. They legit did this exact same concept. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not kidding. Uh, but I, I do appreciate it, especially if we're looking at the lens of post-2015 Goosebumps, that this feels more closer to the books than 20, uh, 2023 show and the first movie. Um, I would take this, and I think what made this movie hit better for me, honestly... Is not having Rob Letterman attached to it all that much. I think that was probably the best move. And I know there's some controversy because let's get that cat out the bag. 
You know what I think plays into the bias of hate of this movie? Is that the fans were pissed that they didn't get Horrorland, so they went into this movie to hate watch it. They did not come into this movie with a fair shake. They were like, screw you, we didn't get Horrorland, we got a slappy movie, I'm going to hate on this movie and dog it. That's how I feel. I do think that still plays a role with quite a few people out there, uh, given the context and the conversations I've had with said people. But um, I know the production hell they had going to make this movie. I know they had many different scripts. They had to keep revising things. They had to remarket it many times. They had Haunted Halloween on the posters. And then when they released it on home video, they took off Haunted Halloween because I guess it had negative stigma uh, because people had gave negative backlash to it. Uh, but then it's back on when you watch it on cable. I don't get that stuff and why they do that to begin with. Um, but I think BD's right on the money. People hating on this movie because they're fans of the original movie or they wanted Horrorland instead um, or not giving people a fair, the, the real transparency here and not giving the movie a fair shake. Um, I think it's very well done for what it is, for what it is. Um, it feels, in my opinion, um, about on par if not a little bit better than at least two out of the three dummy episodes from the original Goosebumps show uh, in terms of slappy stories. BD, you have something you want to add? Yes, I wanted to bring up two things that I also think that the movie does really well that I didn't highlight and also kind of plays in my score because I actually give this movie a 9 out of 10. I actually think that it's quite a great movie overall, and the only reason I deduct um, it from being a perfect score is because, of course, the negatives we brought up, the kin, the rehashing, and all that stuff. But I think some of the positives this movie does really well is I brought up Halloween Town for the climax. But that's actually a little bit inaccurate because Halloween Town, when you actually go to Halloween Town, it's a very organized setting. It's kind of like a whole society. But if you wanted a good comparison to how this climax is, if you've seen Nightmare Before Christmas and the chaos within that Halloween-spirited town, that Halloween-spirited city... I haven't seen a movie that could replicate that in a long time, but I think Goosebumps Haunted Halloween does a decent job at getting that atmosphere, the feeling, and the chaos that's captured within Nightmare Before Christmas, the animated movie. Because there are so many fun monsters that, yes, they're not recognizable. I understand that. I actually think that that's a fair complaint, that people wanted actual Goosebumps monsters. But personally, if you ask me, how recognizable are the 2015 monsters to what you love in Goosebumps? They are pretty much liberties taken with them. We mentioned the body squeezers. We mentioned the graveyard ghouls not being accurate. We mentioned the praying mantis. That is a cover of Jacobus. It's not actually a monster. There's liberties taken. So the fact that this movie is going in its own direction with the original monsters, I think is actually somewhat commendable. They're going full into the chaos of it. And my final point that I think is also a highlight to this movie is Slappy has a diabolical level of villainy in this movie, and here's why. So did you notice his stages of of how to beat the main characters in this movie? He first tries to drop their guards by being essentially this friendly guy, this family member, that the horrible things that he's doing is for the betterment of the family for him to basically love them and be a part of their group. And they reject him. What does he do next? He starts physically attacking them. He starts thinking, you know what? I have powers. I have the experience. I can beat these kids. And you get into a giant car chase scene. You get into them trying to drown Slappy and put him down the bottom of a lake. Um, The crate style from Creepshow, that's what I got reminded of with that. Um, And essentially when he fails in that and they basically knock him out of the car, what does he do next? He then takes this third method where he then takes the mom hostage. He goes, get, turns the mom into a dummy, takes her hostage, takes the person that all three of these kids rely upon and love, and that is low-key, kind of like a terrorist move if you think about it. He's basically taking their most prized possession, the, 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 the pillar to their life, and then is taking it hostage. And the fourth and final part of his plan is then turning into this giant Age of Ultron Avengers, you know, level threat of a character. So just the fact that Slappy hits all four of those stages in one movie that's not even directly involved with Stein, I think that that is something really commendable. But I know Bruce had a point, so Bruce, go ahead with your point. So, okay, I actually forgot, but I I wanted to say this, too, because... um. So at the time of 
I think, yeah, 2018. I think I was about 10 years old when this film came out. And at that age, I don't want to sound like a jerk saying this, but I should think most stuff, just being out of respect for parents paying for, you know, seeing a film, I should think it is at least pretty good. However, when I first saw this and know I was not part of the group that, you know, was like, about to hate it watching. I was very excited for this thing, you know, like very, very excited. And I still just thought it wasn't very good. I thought that it was a bit worse when I first watched it in the theater. Upon rewatch, like I said, that I think it definitely gets better as I mature a little, but I, yeah, I can't really say much. And I think this is definitely supposed to be hitting from what I can tell. I mean, it's goosebumps that, younger audience and at 10 years old like i said you should probably be liking most things you're watching in the theater especially if you really love an ip it's based on so i don't know it's just something interesting i wanted to add i want to actually make the argument that this movie while the first movie had that typical family adventure idea this one actually had like a mild thriller idea and for kids, it, it felt like a thriller movie where you get bits and pieces of this unhinged character, kind of like a, I want to say a Patrick Bateman level, but Slappy feels like a person, like in a common thriller movie where you see him just descend more and more and more into the crazy. And um, I think the stuff with the mom, at, at least, is scarier or more frightening and unnerving to think about and witness than anything we saw in that first movie. I mean, bar none. I mean, you see monsters come and go in that first movie. Yeah, they could look creepy. I would give my tat. I, I would tip my hat to that clown makeup. I thought that was kind of cool, um, even though they don't really they never use them. Uh, but still, uh, I feel like the monsters were more focused in this movie. And I think I think having we we all said it. They should have had less monsters and focused it more. Well, Goosebumps Two is that answer to that. At least we had a smaller cast of monsters. We didn't have some crazy every single Goosebumps book monster ever just in a giant ant hill, and we only get to see like the ones that come to the surface. <laughs> I mean, at that point, what's the point of having all that? Um, Bruce, you want to have some, had, add something to that? Although I think that would have been, like, a great point, I still, like, really respect that. At the same time, when you have this, like, creepy mom stuff going on, you'd expect other stuff to be, you know, on par with that. Well, no, there's other stuff that tries to do something similar, but it just looks stupid. Like, some random janitor in a Target turning into, like, a goblin or something. Like, what was that? Like, that's kind of my question. It's like, are you going to try to do, like, this goofy stuff? And this dude's, like, just, like, mumbling to himself and falling slappy. Are you going to have this creepier side of things? It feels like the movie just doesn't know what it wants to be. Bringing up that argument again with the whole timeline thing. I also feel like the general themes, general themes and, like, genres are, like, kind of confusing. I don't really know what to classify this movie under, because it feels... It doesn't really feel like a comedy, you know? I mean, there's pieces of it, but it doesn't feel like a comedy like the first movie. It definitely doesn't feel like an action movie. But can I really call it a horror movie? Not really. I don't know what to call this thing. I feel like it's, like, a family movie. Like, if you saw... If you looked up fam free family movies on your TV... This is, like, the top result. Like, I just feel like there isn't much substance to make it different from other things, and I feel like that's my big issue. I will say this. I, I think it has scarier moments than Zombie Town, or even Spirit Halloween, for that matter. <laughs> what um, that? I don't know. BD put up some balloons, and I think he's trying to make a point. But I'm just saying, you know... <sighs> This fits more into that DCOM or that classic DCOM Halloween, uh, in my opinion. Uh, it, it, like, just, just imagine, you strip the Goosebumps off of it. Strip Goosebumps off of it. Strip Slappy, make, make it a new monster villain, similar, maybe a dummy with multiple powers, I don't care. And just make it own standalone kids horror movie. 
I think kids would have loved this as an alternative or an answer to Goosebumps 2015. But since it has Goosebumps and because of that predisposition that we are expecting that we get uh, basically a carbon copy of 2015 just with new monsters fronting the bill uh, and we get the same similar plot, uh, Jumanji again. Well, I, I feel like it, diver it di diverted enough expectations for me. But the first time I watched this, I watched this right after 2015, and I was not really impressed with it. So I had low expectations going into this. Coming out of it, I was kind of blown away with my expectations being kind of met. <laughs> so, uh, and then some. Uh, BD and I think Bruce have points. Who wants to go first, BD? Well, the balloons clearly want me to make my point at this point because they keep popping up. But I wanted to say that I think there are a few factors that I think definitely makes this, I guess, movie stand out. And I think one of them, I, I did notice this while watching Goosebumps 2015, but they had this gimmick in the climax that I don't know if anybody else caught this. Maybe it's just me. But you know how in the theater, or I guess, or not in the theater, but in the dance, when they had everyone dancing to those neon disco lights, and then they have, you know, yeah, 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 you know, heads roll off with your head, yeah, yeah, dance till you're dead. And then they have all these monsters show up. It, to me, felt a lot like a giant, like, monster mash. Like, it felt sort of that I feel like the movie was trying to bank on that fun aspect more than the actual horror thriller aspect, like, completion is brought up, where it feels like a giant monster party with the atmosphere of the dance, with all the creatures that are showing up there. And I felt like at any point, you know, they're about to start dancing to thriller. It didn't really feel like an actual horror movie in a certain sense. But when you watch you know, Haunted Halloween, I think the reason why people associate 2015 with being better in quality is because, I mean, I'm a marketing major. So when 2015 is a hit movie, it's extremely popular. Again, I told you the Werewolf of Fever Swamp clip, 500 million views, people love this thing. They think that that's the standard then for what the Goosebumps movies should be. But in my opinion, the first movie was built on a faulty foundation. Even though it was successful, even though it was popular, it was built on a Jumanji ripoff. So actually, Haunted Halloween's first half is doing what a Goosebumps movie should be, a cohesive story with the character that they're expanding upon. And I didn't even think about this factor, but because Slappy got abandoned by R.L. Stein and R.L. Stein and Slappy in the first movie, uh, Slappy sort of had a relationship with Stein where he's like, you know, you're me. I'm you. We are together. We're in this for life. You and I are partners in crime. And then R.L. Stein leaves him behind. I think the fact that they open up with the family angle to this movie builds on the ending of 2015 because Slappy needs companionship. He, he's basically lost his father in a sense. The guy who created him, the guy who's the second half, you know, the yin to his yang. And now he actually needs a purpose. And when that purpose is gone from him, Slappy's sort of acting more like a vengeful child than the normal manipulative mastermind type of guy we see in other dummy movies. So the fact that Haunted Halloween is kind of going down that Goosebumps route and is actually more consistent than a lot of Stein sequels in terms of the 2015 canon in that regard, I think that's pretty well done. And I think that that's why I kind of view it as higher quality because, okay, yes, kids will probably like the adventure aspect of 2015 more. But... Goosebumps really needs to be cohesive stories. If we want a creep show format, if we wanted what Romero was going to do, if we wanted, you know, uh, other stuff involving Goosebumps, it needs to be something of substance, of cohesency, of like actual material, as opposed to, again, a Jumanji ripoff, where it's just throwing 2015, it throws the movie into 50 different directions that are fun, yeah. But at the end of the movie, did you feel like it was one cohesive story? No, it felt like a roller coaster. It felt like you went to Disney World, went on that Haunted Mansion ride. You went through a bunch of different activities and stunts and stuff. And by the end of the movie, you're like, okay, that was a fun time. Well, 25, well uh, 2018, it actually feels like a complete story. So I think for the reason why people didn't resonate with it as much is, again, what completionists brought up. They were, some, in some cases, hate-watching. But also, 2015's popularity that's what spoils people's opinion because you think that that's what Goosebumps should be, but actually a lot of adult reviewers, I'm surprised, don't commend the fact that Haunted Halloween is what we kind of wanted more. So that's my thoughts behind it. 
one thing one thing to add before we I, I give it over to Bruce and we wrap this up. I, I do think that 2018 and one thing that I think people don't give it enough credit for, uh, like like you already brought up, like the actual attention to plot. I feel like I feel like 2015 is that you know that typical blockbuster feel where you know kids are gravitated to these type of movies because they, there's there's not a lot of stuff to peel back. It's just action happening. Scenes are constantly taking you different places in the story. It's zigzagging. It's giving you all. It's trying to give you as much monsters as possible. Uh, it's it's a fan service movie at the end of the day. 2015 is a movie made for fans, right? And 2018 is a movie made to be like a Goosebumps book, right? And in my opinion, just from uh, observations, I think people were upset that when they saw this movie and they and they liked that for what it was. Oh, this is a movie for fans or this is what you call it a normie <laughs> the idea of goosebumps when they started to actually have to think or kind of get down into that oh we're actually getting to a goosebump story it made it easier to kind of see more flaws than the first movie because i'm going to be honest if you're constantly having something thrown in your face you can't pick up on every little bad detail there because you're just like taking it all in but in 2018, it's more taking its time when it's throwing it in your face, and you have much more reaction. Um, That's what she so, said. Pause. Pause. Uh, but you know, at the end of the day, I think I think I'm with you there, BD. Uh, Bruce, you have something you want to add before we close out? Yeah, a good way to close this out, I feel, is just saying that although. We can all have our own opinions. I feel like just Goosebumps, the movie in general, didn't really need a sequel. I think that the movie is just a fine standalone film. And I feel like if they were supposed to make sequels, I guess, they should have just called it Goosebumps Haunted Halloween. Not Goosebumps 2, but just Goosebumps Haunted Halloween. Have it completely unrelated to the first movie. Don't have Jack Black. Have something else. Which is kind of what I thought was happening, but then they tie Arl Stein in, and there's just a ton of weird plot convenience and just a bunch of stuff that, well, I'm not really a big fan of. So, I mean, take that your own way, but I think we can kind of agree, if even if you think this movie is good, that there was no, I guess, there, there should be no Goosebumps too. If they should, they, I think that this movie does matter to Goosebumps, and it actually has formed a lot of what is modern slappy books, if we can agree on that. You know, it's a lot of, like, powers instead of the older books, which kind of rely on just, like, the living dummy kind of thing. So, I will say, this is, it means a lot to Goosebumps history. However, I wish this movie wasn't exactly a direct sequel. I think that it's just not that great at doing it. And I, I do think you, we have uh, we brought up this good point. One last thing before we close out: uh, what they did to Jack Black, you know, given given him the Jamie Lee Curtis and Halloween Resurrection treatment by forcing him to come back due to contract, and they put him in like ten minutes of the movie. Why is R.L. Stein in this? I mean, you don't need him. I think it honestly would have been better without that forced in, because I think that would have helped people uh, at least cope a little bit with it and be like okay, we're not getting Arl Stein and Jack Black in this movie. Um, that would have helped. But the fact that you had to force him in there, I can totally understand might piss you off if you like Arl Stein in the first movie because you make him a nothing character in a bit role for less than 10% of the entire film. So, yeah, I agree with you. It should not have been tried and marketed as, oh, Jack Black's going to be in this movie. Cause I, I think I saw the trailer and there was a hint that Arl Stein's coming back. I think that was like actually teased in there. Like you didn't need to do that and then bait and switch people, especially after you publicly announce there's going to be a horror land movie. And then you <laughs> change it on a whim like that. You know, what's similar to that uh, dead easy from tales from the crypt. We talked about it on my other channel. They had that, they announced it. And what did we, they get, they got Bordello of blood instead. That's basically what happened here. Uh, but that's this is the inverse of that where I think this is genuinely good compared to what we talked about there. But still, but still, same idea. Um, 
marketing goes a long way in transparency at the end of the day. I honestly, like, like I, I still believe this. Um, people went in there, hate watching it. Uh, if you're out there and you're one of the people scorned by Horrorland, I'm sorry you were scorned. Um, but stop saying this movie is bad because it wasn't bad. And stop saying this movie is bad um, just because you're a fanboy of 2015. No, actually watch the movie and give it a shot. Um, but yeah, that's our thoughts on Goosebumps 2015 and Goosebumps 2 Haunted Halloween. I would really want to thank um, the Horror Tavern and uh, Goosebumps enthusiasts for coming on. I want to put uh, this, uh, the links to their channels and their um, things that they use on social in the description and in the comment section of this video so you can go check out what they put out. Um, and they're great people. Please go sub them up. Um, I want these guys, you know, right where I'm at in subs. They deserve it. Um, and, uh, yeah, until next time, see you all later. Let, let us know down in the comment section, which movie do you prefer? Do you like Goosebumps 2015 more? Do you like Haunted Halloween more? And, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll discuss and maybe debate with you in the comment section. Until next time, take care. Have a good night. Peace.